the trouble with this argument of our great scholar McKittrick, again, is that it, it's a, it purely is a political argument. In other words, it argues that a flaw in the political structure of the South is the real problem. But another way of looking at it is the organization of Southern society itself generated policies which were counterproductive and also created irreconcilable opposition which um, a, a different political structure might not have been able to deal with anyway. Planter control determined how the war would be waged. Um, start at the very basic with money, right? How do you finance? A war requires a lot of money. Far more money than the federal government had ever had to raise before the Civil War. How do you, where do you get this money? Well, there are three ways to finance a war. This is oversimplifying. One, taxation, right? Taxes is the way to raise money. Two, borrowing. Issue bonds, which will be repaid down the road with interest. That's future taxation. To pay the bonds, you're going to have to have more taxation, but you're putting it off for a while. And third, issuing paper money, like we just saw. And, you know, paper money to pay for things. Um, now, both North and South used all three. Uh, both issued a lot of paper money and suffered, therefore, from inflation because the more money there is in circulation, the more prices go up because there's more money chasing scarcer goods. But the Union derived far more, a far, a far higher percentage of its income from taxation than the South did. This is one of the problems of the liberty, I mean, this is one of the complaints of the libertarian critique of Lincoln, that he instituted all these taxes. It's the modern state, the income tax, but ta everything was taxed, excise taxes. The tariffs, yes, they raised the tariff to enormous levels in the Civil War. Not because Charles Beard was there in 1860 saying the tariff is the cause of the war, but that's the way you raise money. You tax imported goods. Now, later, the tariff became a fixture to protect northern industrialists. But it's instituted in the Civil War to get money um, to help pay the war. Then they issue a lot of bonds. But in the South, far more is from paper money. And in other words, what I'm saying is the planters didn't want to pay the taxes to finance the war they had themselves brought on. They, they're the ones with the money. If you're going to tax people in the South, the planters are going to pay the bill. Yeah, you could tax merchants. You could tax poor people. Well, you're not going to get much money by doing that. Um, the planters have the money. And if you have a tax system, you've got to go after where the money is. But they didn't want to pay taxes. I mean, I can well understand that. But that created a great problem for the Confederate finance system. They did eventually. Now, also, as we'll see next time, the paper money issued in the North was declared to be what they call legal tender. That is to say, you've got to accept this money. I don't care if you don't think it's worth anything. If I owe you money, I borrowed money from you. Yeah, see that guy? I can borrow a lot of money. Let's say I borrowed, but in the, I borrowed before the war, it's, in, it's gold or it's money back with gold. That's real money. Now, I've got all this paper money, it's legal tender. I can pay you back with this money. Creditors run for the hills. They don't want to be paid back in money which is worthless. But nonetheless, legally you can. So that makes the money acceptable everywhere. It's legal tender. The South did not make their paper money legal tender. Therefore, you could accept it or not as you saw fit, which meant its value deteriorated far faster than in the North because people just wouldn't accept it uh, unless they were you know, strong patriots, et cetera etc. Um, they did institute in 1863 what they called the tax in kind, where the army would simply appropriate goods from farms and plantations, uh, crops, you know, equipment, and give you receipts and everything. But that caused enormous resentment, as we'll see in a minute, from poorer families who found it, you know, who found it really a gigantic burden for the army to come along and take a bunch of their growing crops or, or what farm equipment they have, et cetera. 
The main economic resource of the South, of course, was, was slaves, but also cotton. And they could never figure out what to do with their cotton. That was the most valuable thing they had. Do you just, some people said, the government should just seize all the cotton. The crop of 1860 was gigantic, four million bales. The government should appropriate that cotton and sell it overseas, and that's the way to get money. Cotton, even though there's a blockade, it's not very effective. But they actually took the opposite plan, which was the cotton embargo. Because remember, the king cotton idea had gotten very deeply built into the southern psyche. The notion, as Hammond said, cotton is king. No power on earth dares to make war on cotton, 1858. Well, the theory was, since the British, we know, are just, you know, interested in money, right? They don't care about anything except money. If we withhold our cotton, the British, you know, industrial sites, the factories will run out of cotton very soon. And they'll start losing money, and they'll have to throw people out of work. It'll cause all sorts of disruption in Britain. And they will be forced to recognize the Confederacy. You know, this will be a, um, well, sort of like today, you know, with our economic sanctions we've put onto Russia, which usually don't really work all that well, but, um, but that, you know, that use the economic power to force another country to do something you want them to do. Well, so, but it didn't work. It didn't work for a number of reasons. One, the previous cotton crop, 1859, was also so big that there were giant stockpiles of cotton still in existence in England. So the cotton famine, which does happen, doesn't really take hold for another year or so until late 1862. So the first year or so of the war, King Cotton diplomacy or the cotton embargo is not really having any particular effect. Secondly, a lot of people are, sh are secretly shipping cotton anyway through the blockade or to the north, selling it to the north. Again, I don't mean, you know, there were these planters, most of them were certainly loyal Confederates, but quite a few of them wanted to make a buck also. And they would, particularly when the Union Army gets into the Mississippi Valley, you'll find a lot of planters selling cotton, even though it's totally against the Confederate policy, to speculators and others in the Union Army for sale to the North. Because one of the things that happens because of the cotton embargo is the price of cotton goes sky high on the world market. Cotton becomes even more valuable if you can get it out and sell it. One result of that, since all policies have unintended consequences, uh, one result of that is that Britain makes an avid effort to promote other sources of cotton. They move to start growing cotton in Egypt and in India. So when the war ends, the South no longer has the kind of monopoly on cotton that it had before the Civil War. And that means, this is down the road, we'll see, in the late 19th century, there's a giant overproduction of cotton in the world. Cotton is no longer as valuable in the South in the late 19th century because it's being, reprodu it's being produced in many, many places now and far more of it than is really needed. So, after the war, the price of cotton goes down to almost nothing by the uh, 1890s. Nobody understood, you know, knew this when the war was going on, but it had one of the effects. Um, but as the war goes on, the economic situation in the South deteriorates, partly because the areas under northern control grow in size and economic resources are taken away from the South and now under northern control. There are scarcities of all sorts of goods, salt, the, uh, interesting book long ago about salt in the Confederacy, doesn't seem that interesting, salt. But salt was essential for preserving meat, right? That's how they killed their hogs and they preserved it as bacon and other stuff over the winter, but it, without salt you couldn't do that, which was a tremendous hardship to poor families. Another book about ersatz, ersatz, in other words, artificial things. When they ran out of sh leather, they made shoes out of cardboard and stuff, always trying to substitute. So scarcity was a problem, inflation was a problem, um, the excessive issuing of paper money was a problem. Uh, by, the, uh, by the middle of the Civil War, you have, um, wait a minute, let's see if we can find it. Here it is. This is the Mobile Bread Riot of uh, 1863, where a crowd of women, uh, McCurry talks about this kind of thing, a crowd of women is rioting for bread, bread or peace, they say. This is a, a fanciful 
lithograph from a newspaper at the time. It's not an eyewitness uh, account, but it's these Richmond, Mobile, these bread riots where women took to the streets because they couldn't feed their families. And it just shows the economic disruptions that were going on uh, in the South.